Now, before I begin, let me just remind you, if you're here and you're new, uh, if this is your first time here or someone like invited you and you're like, oh, who's this crazy guy on stage talking fast? Just thanks for being here. And I would love the opportunity to get to meet you in the back at the Info Central. You can see it back there, a fancy little sign. Um, I just want to meet you, hear your story, find out how you came to be with us this morning because I think you're cool. And I promise not to be too creepy about it or overly excited, all right? But I just am excited that you're here and we hope uh, that you'll just give us the chance to meet you. We have a gift for you and just want to say thanks for being here. Now, intentional diversity, right? Ooh, right? That word diversity ruffles feathers, shocks and awe. Oh, what are we doing? What are they talking about, right? But really, it's just this title to describe emotion, a certain thing of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, which is how do we love people who are not like me? Which I don't know if you've noticed, but pretty much everyone around you isn't like you. Have you noticed that? Even people in your own family, they share your DNA. You're like, where did you come from, right? <laughs> like, there's just... There's a difference, right? And here's the thing. I have a hard time trying to love people who aren't like me because I honestly am so busy keeping my eyes on myself. You know, when you look like this, you know. I Now listen, here's the thing. I know that at home, at home, you have an outfit in your closet. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. You have an outfit at home that when you wear it, you're just like, yeah, this was made for me. I know you do. Don't act like you don't. And if you're thinking like, Garrett is so vain, like you're 10 times more vain than me just for saying that. You know that you have like a couple pairs of jeans at home, but there's one pair of jeans, like when you put it on, you're like, these were designed for me. Like they just, they fit you so, right? And have you ever been wearing your favorite outfit? Have you ever been walking around and you're strutting your stuff and you're just feeling confident around the office at home doing your thing and you just feel great? You know how we see ourselves really matters, right? Our image of ourself, it's so important because it just gives us these feelings. And have you ever been in that mood and you're wearing your favorite clothes, doing your thing, and then you catch a glimpse of yourself in like a window, a reflection, and you go, oh, and you see like lumps and things. You're like, oh, the, oh, and you want to burn that building down so no one can ever see what you actually look like. Like, have you ever had that moment where it just, the, the air was sucked out of you because your image, how you see yourself is everything, isn't it? How you, how you feel about yourself, what you see, it's, it's, it's everything. And I'll tell you, it got me thinking. In preparation for this talk, how do modern day Christians see themselves? What's like the image in our mind, in their mind, in Christians' mind, what's the image that we project of ourselves that makes us feel certain ways? And I got to think, like, how am I even gonna find this information? So I did what we all would do. I Googled it. And I Googled basically like Christians, how they see themselves in art. And so, because, because again, remember, anytime that you want to know what a certain culture or group of people think of themselves at a certain period of time, look at their art. Art tells you a lot about what they think, what they feel, what's going on in their consciousness. So I found some interesting things. Now, what really shocked me was when I looked on Google images for like how Christians imagine themselves, I could only find two dominant themes of how Christians think of themselves. And I'm shocked that there were not more. There were literally only two images. I'm going to show you a couple pictures that are about the first one. The first one is that of like a warrior, right? So I found this like looking up how do Christians view themselves and you need to imagine some like 27 year old man living in his mom's basement just be like, this is how I really feel. Like, He's designed, it's like Christians have taken from the passage in Ephesians 6 where it says, put on the full armor of God. And somebody was like, what if that's exactly how it is? And they're like, being a Christian is having a sword, you know, like that's what this guy's imagining it means to follow Jesus is it's like arrows are flying at you. And if you're a good Christian, you're full of armor, powerful. Look at this image of strength and control and power. Look at the next one. Give a middle schooler a pencil. And he doodled. And he's like, man, our wrestling... Sorry, I hit my microphone. This is not a wrestling match against a human opponent. Like, look at how cool. And those swords are epic, right? Like, you want... It's like Game of Thrones level Christianity, you know? Like, whoa. And then so someone was like, you know, we don't live in the medieval times anymore. Like, we need an image of like a warrior Christian, what would that look like today? So someone made this, Spirit Realm Sniper is the title. 
Now, I, I can't get enough of this picture because the image is pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer. And it's as if spiritually you're sniping for your friends around you because you prayed for them. Like, look at the image. What does this say about how we feel about ourselves? So this is the first dominant main theme is Christians see themselves as like secret disguised warrior soldiers. Wow, powerful. But then there's another image. The other theme that you see is something very different in light of all this. It's people who think that all we do as Christians is walk around with our hands up. And so like, this is all you will find on Google Images. I swear, I've looked longer than I care to admit. Like, is there any other thing? This woman was caught like in a rainbow, I guess. Um, she went looking for the pot of gold and found herself singing. She has her AirPods in, I think. Notice the, whole, the little dove. Um, it's like oh, the Holy Spirit's doing this. So it's very, oh, you know, just Christians just walk around worshiping all day. I guess that's what it means to be a Christian. Look at the next one. The next one is like a dude doing this. And he's like, you know, when I worship, it's like the movie Alien. A lion just jumps out of my chest. Because worship isn't good enough on its own. It needs to be powerful, manly, scary, Narnia lion jumping out of my chest, right? Then the next one. This is like Bob Marley had a heyday. Um, <laughs> This is all sorts of, look at the stages. It's like it starts with a horn and it ends with you on your knees and a lion made of rainbows comes out from within us, right? These are the two images of modern Christians, of what they think of themselves. And I only find that interesting because it begs the question, is this what Jesus wanted us to think? Did Jesus ever leave us an image of how we should see ourselves? He did. And interestingly enough, it's nothing like these. Interestingly enough, Jesus did have an image that he wanted us to think of what it means to be in his kingdom, what it means to be a follower of him. But unfortunately for us, our self-image is very different from the one he left for us. And what you'll find is that although his image is not what we would design for ourselves, it's more applicable and it's more lasting and pervasive and expansive than you could ever Imagine. Let me show you what it says in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says at that time, says at that time, disciples came to Jesus and asked him, "Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven?" He called a little child to him, and he placed the child among them, and he said, "Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like say it with me, little children, you will never enter. You will never enter." the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Look at the extreme language Jesus is using. He says, I want you to identify yourselves with children. Look at the next time. This happens again. It's recorded in Luke's gospel. This time, Luke 18, people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. Why do we always give our babies to famous people? What is with that weird thing that we do? We're like, oh, are you a president? Are you a pope? Kiss my baby. Why would we do that? Most politicians I've ever heard of are pretty dirty, sleazy people. I don't want them touching my baby. You know what I mean? So people are doing their thing. They're bringing babies to Jesus. And when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Because like, yeah, Jesus has more important things to do than hang out with your slobbery, stinky toddler, right? But Jesus called the children to him. And he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will say it with me, never enter it. This is recorded, this event, this occasion is recorded five different times in the Gospels. And when Jesus says something like never enter it, I think it begs we pay a little more attention to it than we have before. What is Jesus teaching? Why would he leave children as the image for what it means to be in his kingdom, to be a follower of him? Well, let me talk practically about how genius it is to use children as an image for your movement. Because children are readily available everywhere, aren't they, right? Much to our annoyance. They are always around. You're never, what's great is children are everywhere, every continent, culture, language, gender, they're everywhere and they're available, right? You can see kids all right. The other day, I, I got to take my sweet little two-month-old infant onto an airplane. That was so fun because you know those crazy straps that moms wear, like strap on a baby and the baby like hangs there, you know? 
So I had one of those on, and I'm walking through the airport all ch- just excited, you know. And I see this businessman who's on this flight with us, and he's in his nice suit. He's on an important business phone call, adult stuff, drinking his third gin and tonic before he flies on a two-hour flight. And he g- makes eye contact with me, and I swear the joy it gave me to see his face of like, oh, an infant Oh, gosh, what are you doing to me? You've ruined my business trip, right? And I love it. And what's funny about being on a plane with infants is all the parents who have, like, children on a plane group together like zebra avoiding lion because (laughs) no one wants to be able to decipher which kid is crying. It's pretty great. So I say all this because what is it? Like, why did Jesus give us this image? Because children, that image of a child, it transcends culture. It transcends time. It transcends language, and it transcends gender. So why then did Jesus use a child, a kid, as image? You see, here's the thing. The heartbeat of Christ, according to those passages, is that we would possess a life that has the quality of a kid. Why does he want that from us? Why is that his heartbeat, his hope for us, is that we'd have a life with the quality of a kid? What does he see in children? I'm going to be honest with you. I've asked a lot of people. I've had conversations with over 20 people and have a list of their responses. I've read lots of books thinking about this topic. I've spent the last four weeks trying to like, in my brain, contemplate this idea. And I could only find one irreducible truth. I mean, we could talk about how kids are filled with wonder and awe way more easily than we are. We're hard-hearted, right? You know? I I could talk about how Kids are more trusting. They're not so skeptical like we are. I could talk about how kids are more open. They're not cynical yet. I could talk about how kids are more humble and not so always focused on being better than everyone, right? I could talk about all those things, but you know what? They they weren't the irreducible truth. And so what I'm about to tell you, I don't know what you imagine this passage means, but I'm gonna try to give you something that now once you see it, you won't be able to unsee it. So disclaimer, I'm gonna ruin and hijack your view of this passage, whatever you have, but I, it's helped me so much. Now that I see it, I cannot unsee it. I think the reason Jesus picked the image of a kid as the image for understanding what it means to follow him is because kids do not have an unhealthy relationship with control yet. Now, I can just see the mothers in the room right now crossing their arms saying, you've not spent time with my three-year-old daughter. You'll see, Buster. Like, you know, like I, I can imagine some of you are like, no, my kid has terrible control problems. But let me, let me suggest this for a minute. I have an infant, but I've worked with teenagers for almost eight years now just at this church. And what I've learned over and over again is that the weird period of our life in our adolescence is that weird period in our, in our life when we start dabbling with our issues with control and power. What I've seen is that when a little kid lies to you, trying to control you or a situation, it's because they just don't want to get in trouble or they just want to be doing something other than what they're doing right now. But when a teenager lies to you, it's to deceive you. It's to control you. It's to manipulate you. It is to project an image of themselves that's superior, better. We start dabbling with that kind of control in our adolescence. Remember when you were a teenager? If you're a teenager, hi. (laughs) And do you remember how you went from being innocent to feeling not so innocent anymore? And that is because of the ways you and I started developing an unhealthy relationship with control and power. Jesus is saying that the only way we'll ever know what God is up to and what he's about and who he is is if we evaluate our current relationship to control. I mean, think about it. If I were to ask you today, I need you to become more playful, more filled with wonder in your life. You've lost the zest in your career and being a a spouse and being a parent. You've lost your zest for that. How would you do it, right? I would bet you that the only way to become more playful, more kind, more open-hearted, is going to have something to do with your issues with control. I would bet that if I asked you today, hey, you should become more humble, Right? And isn't it funny how church people, Christianity is always like, you got to be humble, but no one tells you how to do it. I'm like, where's the class? Because I'm struggling hard <laughs> for 32 years with this, right? I mean, I mean, I could ask you to raise your hand if you're struggling with humility, but you wouldn't because you're too humble, right? <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Um, you know what I mean? I mean, there's just this like, 
tension with that. And I would bet you that if you and I were going to become more humble, I would bet that it has something to do with our issues with power and trying to control everything around us and people. I think that Jesus used the image of a kid because they don't have an unhealthy relationship with control yet. Today, as we sit here, how would you rate your current relationship with control in your life? Now, I'm going to read what I wrote now because I was so excited when I wrote this. I was like, I can't wait to share this in a room filled with people. Here we go. (laughs) Who in your life right now are you trying to change? Who are you trying to get the attention of? What situation are you pouring? You're not even paying attention to this talk today because you're so consumed with what to do after this. I thought it was good too. I was like, that was great. <laughs> how has your mood and your sanity been shaped today by how much you've been trying to control somebody? What do you believe about control when it comes to your health or your appearance, your money, your home, your car, your career, your religious beliefs, your future, your wins and your losses, your suffering and your victories? And how has your entire life, has it not been a lesson of challenging all your current conceptions of control in each of those areas? How many of us have already ruined our day today and it's only 11.33 a.m. because something or someone didn't do what we wanted and it didn't meet our expectations and we wouldn't and couldn't change it? Who do we become When our control and our power is in question. Who do you become when you lose control of somebody or something? Some of us in this room, the reason we can't hear Jesus, the reason we can't, is your whole life is about control. And I wonder, because Jesus teaches us that there's only two ways to live our life. One is you've put your trust in your control or you've placed your trust in a higher power. He says there's only two postures to life. In fact, isn't it interesting that if you were to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, the first step before you could ever get help is acknowledging that you're powerless. It's the acknowledgement that based on your own power, you don't have the control, the power to change it. So you need to lean upon and call out to and rest with a higher power than your own. Isn't it interesting? But we would be like, well, I don't have an addiction, so I'm good. I don't need to hear that. And yet... It's the basic step of entering the kingdom of God. Christ is asking each of you today, do you really want to base the rest of your life on your current relationship to control? Do you really want the rest of your life to be as it's been in your weird, funky relationship with power and control? The heartbeat of Christ is that we would possess a life that has the quality of a kid, someone who has a healthy understanding of what power and control is. So when it, when it comes to intentional diversity, what, is, what does this have to do with that? has everything. It's foundational to understanding how to love people that are different than you. You know, in this series, we've yet to bring up one of the biggest tensions that exists in this room right now. And one of the biggest tensions that exists in our culture, our country today, and that is the tension of how people from different generations are speaking to each other. Right? Millennials (laughs) versus everyone else, right? And and this tension in our country right now, I mean, right now, you and I are literally sitting in an atmosphere, in a culture, and in a country that is one big giant experiment in a failure to converse and communicate. And it's happening all over. It's happening in your living room. It's happening on your Facebook. It's happening in your office. It's happening on your television. It is all around you a failure. We're talking about really light subjects like abortion, impeachment, child slavery, single parenting, economy, lifestyle, science, education. And then on an inward personal scale, we're dealing with things like our preferences and our beliefs and our values and our opinions and our practices. And oh, by the way, we don't even speak the same language. It's like older people use 11th grade lead, reading level words, like they read the King James Bible, and I'm like, I, I don't know. And then younger people speak in emojis, right? You don't, they, there's, no, there's no translator, right? Often, what's causing massive divide among us is that we are not releasing control. Instead, what we're trying to do is we meet someone from a different generation with us, and because we don't feel like we can control them, we abandon it. We write them off, we make assumptions about them, we label them, and then we cluster together in groups of people that look just like us. 
We, we try to group together. I mean, we all know what the millennials do. They just find a really cool tea, coffee shop, organic, fair traded place that has white wine in the evenings, and it's cool, and it doesn't even have a sign on the outside. It's so inside. Whoa. <laughs> and all we know is that older people just go to Coco's, right? <laughs> Why is it that in our culture we know where to find each other, right? It's that fish fry on Fridays, endless fish, all you can eat. I, listen, I don't want to judge Coco's. If you need a key lime pie at two o'clock on a Tuesday, you know where to go. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. Wow. There's this division. There's this failure to communicate, and we need to be more childlike with one another. We're not born racist. We're not born skeptical. We're not born writing people off, and we're not born hard-hearted. We're not born saying things like, well, they could never understand because they haven't gone through what I've gone through. We're not born saying things like, well, they could never understand. They're too young. They're inexperienced. And we never say things when we're little like, well, they would never understand. They're too old and old-timey and old-fashioned and, and separated and closed-minded from reality. That's a learned behavior. That is a learned attitude. And Jesus says the heartbeat of Christ is that we would possess a life that has the quality of a kid. See, Jesus knew that the only way to be truly great, to become like God in the way we love people and deal with people, is if we were to completely reshape our view of control. For example, how much better would holiday gatherings go if you didn't have to win every discussion? How, how, someone's getting excited at church today. I like that. I like that. Some of you wanted to do that, but you're still too scared. You're not like a kid, you know? Anyways, you know, how would the holiday be different if you didn't have to control all the endings to every conversation and that you were always superior and right, how would that next road trip be if everyone didn't have to eat at the place you wanted to eat and it was your say and you're against everyone else? How about that next summer camp and you really want those kids to learn that Bible verse and memorize it, but they just want to throw mud. Let them throw mud right? It's not always about learning. I'm sorry if you grew up in a church that says it's all about memorizing information. Who wants to do that? We do that everywhere else. Why would we do that? It's about living your life like Jesus. How about that next time you overhear a conversation at a restaurant and it's those crazy millennials or it's that crazy old couple and you don't like what they're talking about. Like, I can't believe how uh, ooh, disrespectful ooh, ah, uh, and you're just labeling and writing them off and you don't even know their name. You know, if, if you want to change what's going on in our world today, let's stop griping about it and Facebooking it and let's get to know a name. Let's talk to somebody. See, what we need to do is be more playful, more curious, more humble, and more trusting with one another. And the only way we're going to do that is if we become like children, followers of Jesus. The only way we're going to get there is if we're like Jesus and we follow him in these relationships instead of writing them off and assuming that they're just wrong and we'll never be able to control them, you and I need to evaluate what is my relationship with control today. So here's two ways, I think. First two steps we could take to becoming more childlike in who we are. Number one, we need to evaluate that circle. We need to look at that circle of people that most are with us. It's kind of our home base. And we need to evaluate who they are. Are they just affirming us always? Are they just always the same? Look, I'm not saying get rid of that circle. I'm saying begin to expand to other ones too. Like for example, our church, we're like, hey, everyone should go through the rooted experience, right? You've heard us talk about rooted all the time. And there's some people in our church who are like, well, I've had the same small group since 1906. And they're so mad that we're trying to change a little. You know, you can keep meeting, but try rooted because heaven forbid we put you with people who are different than you. God, people got so mad at us when Garrett and I, uh, Garrett Abate and I, we decided with our youth ministry to combine it with middle school and high school kids. And everyone's like, ah! like people were shocked that we did that. They couldn't believe it. They're like, what's going to happen when they're in a room together? And I'm like, I don't know. No one's exploded yet. No one's done that yet. You know, what's going to happen is in a week where we always segregate kids and separate the high schoolers from the middle schoolers for two hours in their week, they're in a room with them. And maybe, just maybe something dynamic an incredible could happen. A middle schooler could look up to a high schooler who's a Christian. Remember what you were like when you were in middle school and you saw high school and you're like, you're so cool. Like, <laughs> you, just because they were tall and different, right? And this is the problem is we want to cluster together. Everyone's the same. Makes me feel good. Oh, for my feelings. Get out of here. Like, 
that's not, we're going to grow because we're together. So I just think maybe we need to evaluate that circle. You know, how, how about maybe next week, some of us just sit somewhere different in this room. How many of you right now, we could literally like do something with the chair and find your DNA on it, right? Like, yep, that's their butt cheek, all right, right? What if you move seats next weekend so that you could hear someone's story, make them feel awesome and try to find out who they are, especially if they're of a different age and generation than you. Maybe that's what it would take. Now, the other thing I think we can do, number two, evaluate that circle. Number two, to become like a kid, I think we need to serve a kid. And you better believe this is a shameless plug to join the youth ministry. You better believe it, right? Here's why. Because we need people in this church who want to hold babies, who want to help our elementary kids right next door to us have a place to learn and grow. We need some of you who instead of sending your kids off like, get out of here, goodbye, maybe you'll come back, I don't know. When you see them leave on the bus, maybe you should get on that bus with us and go buddy up with a middle schooler and play paintball with them. Maybe some of you need to mentor a high school student instead of griping about high school students and their horrible driving, and it is horrible. <laughs> maybe, maybe instead of griping, we try to mentor and we try to be present and just simply one word, available to a younger person rather than clustering together. I invite you. I don't know if you know this. We, we have this dynamic new relationship and partnership with Young Life. And, and we partnered with Jay Rennie. He is directing this incredible college ministry because we want to reach more college kids than we ever have before. And we need seven people, seven new people to join that team by August so that you can launch with us this incredible effort to reach more college kids. You know, maybe instead of seeing NAU as a burden to avoid in town because of the traffic, instead of complaining about all those College kids hogging up your line at Taco Bell, maybe it's an opportunity in disguise. Maybe you and I as followers, people who call themselves followers of Jesus, we could see that as an opportunity. To become like a kid, you and I need to serve a kid. And don't let kids scare you. If you're kind of just like, I can't work with kids, I'm inexperienced. You know what? Just start simple. Go like, work in the sound booth where you're operating lights. There's this wall that separates you from them, super safe. It's awesome. Take a baby step. Today, we're going to spend our last moments together just singing uh, and letting ourselves be kids a little bit and just enjoy and just relax. And, and all I ask is that as you hear this song and as you sit with us in this moment, I would just ask that you would remember the heartbeat of Christ is that we would possess a life that has the quality of a kid and that you wouldn't be so consumed with control and controlling yourself and your image and controlling everyone around you and every situation around you. Instead, you would just be present. Like for some of you, when you sing this song today, as you stand and sing this song, maybe you should not worry about what people think of what you look like and just sing it. If you want to raise your hand, raise your hand. That's great. Just have fun with it because the heartbeat of Christ is that we would possess a life that has the quality of a kid. And so by the way, at the end of the service, we have popsicles for you because... When I was a kid, it was all about popsicles. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nothing says childhood more than popsicles. So we're going to have popsicles for you when you leave. I just want to encourage you. We want to help you discover the heartbeat of Christ, which is that you would have the quality, the life of a kid.